Greetings, and welcome to the campus of the Lutheran Theological Seminary at Philadelphia. I am standing at the main entrance to the seminary off of Germantown Avenue. Behind me is the monument to Henry Melchior Muhlenberg that greets students, staff, faculty, and friends and alumni time and time again when they return to this campus. Henry Melchior Muhlenberg arrived in Philadelphia in 1742. He came to take care of three struggling Lutheran congregations. At the end of his ministry, 30 years later, he had established a network of Lutheran congregations up and down the Atlantic seaboard. He had a vision of ministry, of word and sacrament. He had a vision for social ministry, for education, to preach the gospel and share it with everyone. Today, I would like to address your attention to a smaller monument, a smaller monument that is here at the main entrance and is in front of me. It was erected by the class of 1919, and it commemorates a series of events that occurred in this area in 1777. And what I would like to do right now is take you back to those events, to that time and to this place, because it had an impact on our history and had an impact on our seminary. The year is 1776 and 13 colonies decided to declare their independence from Great Britain. They wrote a Declaration of Independence that was eventually signed in the city of Philadelphia. General Washington had troops and he was hoping to enter the city of Philadelphia, the unofficial capital of this new nation, so that he could winter in the confines of the city where there would be food and shelter for the troops. But the British had landed and General Howe was on the march. And on September 11, 1777, he defeated the Continental forces in Brandywine in Chester County. On September 20th, he scored a second victory in Paoli that had a brutal massacre. And so now, here we are, 9-11, Brandywine, 9-20-1777, Paoli. The Continental forces have lost, and Washington is to the north of the city. Winter is on its way, and he wants to, has, he wants to take advantage of one more possibility, one more possibility of getting the British out of the area. But on September 26, Charles Cornwallis marched into the city, and General Howell was there. He left 3,000 British soldiers in the city of Philadelphia, brought over 9,000 here to Germantown. At that time, this part of the city was called Beggarstown. And right behind me, right behind me, was the home of Chief Justice William Allen. It was a fine stone house, several stories, and it had a fine porch. And the porch began right here and went behind me. It was his summer home, and it was called Mount Airy. And when the city heat was too much for him, he would come out to this place, Mount Airy, to the breezes of the cool area of the Wissahickon. Down the way was the home of James Logan, Stenton. Down the way were the, the great houses of Cliveden and Upsal. This was a place where people would come to get away, to get away from the heat and the noise of Philadelphia. And General Howe brought 9,000 troops to Germantown because he was after General Washington. Washington knew that winter was coming and the war would cease, and he was hoping one more time to get the British out of the Delaware Valley. Washington conferred with his staff, and they decided to launch a battle. Even though they had been defeated at Brandywine, even though they had lost to Paoli, they were going to launch one more battle, this time here in Germantown. They decided they would use the element of surprise, the element that had given them a victory in Trenton. And so on the night of October 3rd, columns of Continental troops left and came towards Germantown. One column would come down Ridge Avenue. A column would come down Germantown Avenue. A column was to come down Limekiln Pike. 
and another column was to come down through White Marsh onto Old York Road, and all would converge on Germantown in the early dawn of October 4th, 1777. So imagine the trees are changing their color, the British are settled in, and here, on October 4th, at 5 a.m., 5 a.m. in the morning, in the dawn, covered with fog, Continental soldiers come around the corner of the house and surprise the British pickets that were stationed here at Allen's summer home in Mount Airy. The British were astonished. And the battle seemed to be going well, and the British kept commanding them to stay in place because they were interested in immediately leaving to call defeat and to, re to head back into Germantown. But they said that it was only a scouting party. But then the Continental Army had brought a cannon with them and they fired the cannon into the infantry division. The cannon that fired grape shot scared the infantry that were stationed here at the house of Chief Justice William Allen and they immediately retreated south to Chew House. There they made their stand. Washington and Sullivan pursued them to Chew House and could not get them to come out or to surrender. And other things happened as well. The two columns that were to come from the west, one got lost, one was delayed, the fog was thick, they began to hear the shots, the cannon fire, they actually were confused and turned on each other, an American soldier was firing on American soldier, then they figured out they were allies, turned their attention to Germantown. But Chew House pr proved to be invincible. The cannons could not pierce the stone walls and the soldiers were determined not to surrender. They were the ones that were involved in the Paoli massacre and they were afraid if they would surrender, they would be massacred as they had massacred continental soldiers in Paoli. Fortunately, Green did arrive late, but it was fortunate because Washington and Sullivan could retreat and leave. And then at the end of the day, the remaining continental soldiers left the town of Germantown. They had lost the battle. They had now lost Brandywine, they had lost Paoli, and they lost Germantown. They headed up, crossed the Schuylkill River, they would cross into Valley Forge, and there they would spend winter. General Washington and his staff revisited the Battle of Germantown, looked at the mistakes they had made, and learned from them. But things were beginning to change for the Continental Army and for their cause here in the Delaware Valley, but more importantly in Europe. Military advisors in France, military advisors in Prussia were astonished at the tenacity of the Continental Army. They were astonished that this army, which was just over a year old, was willing to take on a major player in the European political arena. They had suffered defeat at Brandywine, they suffered defeat at Paoli, but they made one more attempt to take advantage of a small window of opportunity to possibly defeat the British. And that attracted the attention of France and Prussia, who after that moment became allies of the young United States, who then began to support the cause of the, the 13 independent colonies. And so it was. This group of people, soldiers, individuals, citizens, were rallying around a cause. They were tenacious, and others saw potential and gave their support. In 1864, there had been several attempts to establish a seminary in Philadelphia. The Ministerium of Pennsylvania had a seminary for three years, 1773 to 1776. It was a success, but with the outbreak of war, the seminary had to close its doors. And once again, the ministerium went back to the tradition of raising up new leaders for Lutheran churches through an apprenticeship program. The pastors would hand candidates books and they would meet occasionally to discuss what they had read, to highlight, to underline the important parts of what they had read, and then sent them back home to continue reading in theology, the biblical languages, church history. It was distance education. 
in the 18th century. They had tried to support a seminary in Gettysburg, but it was remote in the center part of the state. In the 1840s, the Ministerium of Pennsylvania thought they would support a seminary in Columbus, Ohio. And candidates for ministry would travel to Ohio for their formal education. But again, geography was working against them. And there was always this cry for a school in Philadelphia. In addition to that, there were also intense discussions about worship, liturgy. There were very intense discussions about language, German, English. And then in the 1840s, immigration from Germany began to pick up on a scale that had been unprecedented. Hundreds of thousands of immigrants were arriving in the Delaware Valley every year, speaking a language other than English. Between 1848 and 1860, the Ministerium of Pennsylvania ordained 18 candidates to the ministry. During that same period, there were 20 vacancies caused by pastors retiring or dying. That did not account for the number of requests for pastors in congregations that were forming in Philadelphia in Pottstown, in Reading, in Allentown, in Bethlehem, in Easton, by immigrants who were arriving and wishing to transplant their pre-migration spirituality within the walls of a sanctuary that they built. They wanted to sing the hymns that they had heard from childhood on. They wanted to say the catechism in the language that had been taught them during confirmation. They wanted to worship God in the German language, and there weren't enough pastors and the ministerium was besieged with requests year in and year out. And finally, geography, worship, liturgy, language, finally came together. And two pastors decided it was time to open a seminary in the city of Philadelphia. They had the assistance of a third professor who came from Gettysburg who was to teach German and courses in German, Charles Schaeffer. He allied with William Julius Mann and Charles Porterfield Cross, and they opened a seminary in the city of Philadelphia. The three faculty members opened the doors to a new school on Art Street. There they were going to offer instruction in two languages. English and German. They were going to raise up a new generation of bilingual leaders that would serve the growing Lutheran Church in the Delaware Valley and beyond. Those doors opened on October 4, 1864, the same day that the battle had been fought here in Mount Airy. Those three professors were driven by the same energy that motivated the Continental forces. They saw a need, they saw a cause, and they responded. And they gave their all for that cause. It was a small, it was a small moment packed with a great deal of energy. And it grew, and it flourished. In the 1870s, they had students coming from all sections of the Delaware Valley to be trained and raised up for leadership in churches across the Delaware Valley and in the Midwest. And then in the 1880s, they decided it was time to relocate the seminary and they looked for possibilities. They had a possibility out in West Philadelphia, but it was too close to the railroad tracks. They wanted to leave the city of Philadelphia because it was noisy, it was dusty, and they were subject to epidemics and outbreaks of disease. And they came here to Mount Airy. They purchased this land in the 1880s, and then they built a dormitory in 1888. And then came the day of dedication. It would be October 4th, 1889. Because they saw in that date, they saw in that date something remarkable and special. And it started here in 1777 when a group of tenacious soldiers tried to rout the British Army, take on a major player in the European arena. 
It took hold, it was an important date in 1864, when three faculty members opened a door to a small seminary to begin a work of faith that would go out and teach in English and in German so that the faith could be shared here in this land. And then it occurred again. On October 4th, 1889, faculty, students, and friends of the seminary came here to this spot. They came to dedicate themselves and these grounds to a, new, to a cause, theological education, raising up a generation of leaders for a multicultural society. They dedicated Gowan Mansion that we know as Hagen Hall. Inside that building were the new lecture halls. On the third floor was the library. On the other side of that building was the large dormitory that would house seminarians who were interested in being educated in German and in English so that they could go out and minister, preaching the gospel in German and in English, administering the sacraments in German and in English. They were committed to a cause, just as the soldiers who came around that, this corner on October 4th, 1777, they were committed to a cause and they were tenacious. And because of that commitment, they attracted attention. The Continental Army, as I said, lost at Brandywine, Paoli, and Germantown. But military advisors in France and Prussia were astonished. Three seminary professors opened the doors of a theological seminary in Philadelphia on October 4th, 1864, and they attracted attention because people saw potential for raising up a new generation of leaders here in an urban setting committed to multicultural ministry. In 1889, people saw the potential in this school and they backed it with their prayers and with their support. So I stand here today at the intersection of the Battle of Germantown, the founding of a seminary in the city of Philadelphia, and its relocation here in Mount Airy in 1889. It was committed to a cause and it attracted potential. We're celebrating 150 years of service to the church, raising up leaders for ministries of word and sacrament and word and service. And so I am bold to invite you to join us in this great campaign, in this great ministry, and to share the excitement that is still here at this spot in Mount Airy, the main entrance to the seminary. Thank you.